It's a big AC unit. Let's talk about kilns. Hey class, today, <laughs> Mr. G here. Uh, there's a big AC unit off to the side. I'm visiting a friend of mine at her studio. Um, we're working on a ceramics class. This is my summer session. And I definitely want to put this video out there for you guys. So I made a video for a the art, the online art teacher group on Facebook. They, If you're not a part of that group, it's a great group for art educators so that we can be more uh, integrated worldwide so that we get more people involved in how to teach art in different places, different aspects. And they contacted me, they're like, hey, can you do a video for us uh, for our symposium they're doing? So I said, sure, what do you guys want? Something on clay. Cool, got it on clay. So this video that, we, that I made for that group gives the i'm going in and demystifying kilns and and really trying to go over the all the basics of everything you need to know about a kiln if you don't have uh kiln knowledge and you haven't been around a kiln a whole lot this will at least get you to where you don't feel scared of firing stuff on the regular before we, before we go into the video i definitely want to ask you a or a or b do you guys use a digital a manual kiln old school manual kiln for the a group or do you use a new school digital kiln in the b group you guys know i've seen some of my videos in the past where I go over kilns i have a digital kiln myself but i was raised on old school manual manual kilns including uh gas kilns so gas raku refractory and all this stuff all these things are going to be uh slightly touched on in today's video so look forward to that and uh, i'll see you guys on the other side so for my lesson I do a lot of clay. I do a lot of ceramic stuff. I was just filming some videos on a uh, one lidded one throw piece vessel, doing some slip decoration on a wheel thrown pot. And I'm kind of in the middle of a summer ceramic series that I'm working on for my channel. I thought that number one thing that I get asked by all, all of my new teachers, I've taught all grade levels before, but I, I take a lot of pride in at my district in my area, we have a new teacher group and the, we meet once a month. And this is for new teachers to the district. The number one thing that I get asked or that we constantly talk about is 3D, incorporating 3D into the classroom, specifically ceramics, which that's my forte. I love ceramics. I love clay. I've got clay caked under my nails after being on the wheel for a few hours. Using the kiln is kind of one of those like high threshold of where people have a lot of concern. They don't understand the processes, the ins and outs of how a kiln works. And some people are just scared to work with a kiln, work with clay. So my class today is kind of demystifying and making kiln a lot less scary. That's my topic today. Basics of a kiln. This is a kiln. Okay, cool. Class is over. No, the the kiln itself, there's a couple different variations of a kiln and most of us work with an electric kiln and these kilns can vary by different companies. You have Scut, Olympic, Olymp L and L's, it's Olympic. Mine's an Olympic. But you have all these different brands, but they all do the same exact thing. They cook the clay to full vitrification. If you want to know the big term of the day, the big term of the day is vitrification. Vitrification is baked the clay to its full to its furthest cone temperature. Like I said, you have gas and you have electric. Most schools in general have an electric kiln inside of them. The reason why they have electric kilns is because an open flame is scary. And I'm on that side of the fence too. I, uh, an open kiln and just to leave it at that, I think that's a lot of a lot of variables that are questionable, uh, especially if you have a pyromaniac ninth grader not a good thing but between these two tests between these two things they still do the exact same thing they, they're heating up the clay to to bake it to its proper form doing that you're you've got a gas element which is providing an open flame to the you can have an oxidization firing and you can also have a reduction firing an oxidization firing is where you're just cooking the clay itself within the air of the kiln uh, reduction firing is where you're actually starving the kiln of air uh, or oxygen, and that's gonna create a different result on the outside of the kiln, on the outside of the pieces. Now with an electric kiln, you only have heated elements. So basically the same as an oven in your house. Uh, if you've ever taken your oven and you switch to cleaning mode, what that does is the oven itself, the top temperature, if you got a dial, I'm old school, got a little dial on mine, goes up to 500 degrees. If you are cleaning a, uh, an oven, it has that lock. The reason it's locking is because what it's doing, it's trapping the heat inside the oven to incinerate all the food particles that are inside the oven that's heating up to about seven to eight hundred degrees depending on what manufacturer you have the kiln is doing the exact same thing except there's no latch to to like hold it closed and that thing's getting a lot hotter than that and but it, what it's doing is taking a physical and chemical change to the outside of the clay 
But again, the basic difference between gas kiln and electric kiln is the type of the element, but they both do require a burn test. Now the burn test I think is very important. And this is especially for, if you've been out of your classroom for a while and you need to reaffirm that everything is working properly, most of you won't have a gas kiln because if you have a gas kiln, you just turn it on and see the flame. If there's a flame, it's working fine. Uh, you kick it up and the flame's gonna shoot up higher and, you're gonna, and you can use a parameter test that the kiln is heating up properly. That's the burn test that you'd use in the gas kiln. For the electric kiln, this is a lot more pyromaniac fun. Uh, what you're gonna do is you're gonna get small little strips of paper. So if you just have a regular sheet of notebook paper, all you're gonna do is you're gonna tear little strips, about like so. Or if you have a sticky pad and you just wanna put little sticky notes in there, you can totally do that, it does the exact same thing. What we're doing is we're putting our piece of paper in between the element and the kiln wall. You definitely want the paper touching the element. You're gonna kick it on high and inspect to make sure, and you only need to leave it on for about two minutes max, uh, because if it takes longer than that, then something's probably wrong with one of your coils. What we're doing is we're ensuring that the each coil is heating up and charring that paper slightly to ensure that all of the elements are working properly. The reason that we're doing this is because we wanna make sure that our elements are working properly because if they're not, you're not gonna reach temp inside of that kiln. And over time, these things just wear out over time and you just replace them. It's not hard to replace them. Shoot a video as soon as one of mine goes out, I will make one of those for my own channel. But the reason that we do that burn test is to ensure that everything works properly. Uh, if you get an error code, if you have a kiln sitter like I have, and also such as this, if you have a kiln sitter, then uh, this is, throws an error code. And sometimes you don't know what the error code is and you have to look it up. And this just makes it a little easier because you can just eliminate process of elimination, eliminate the things that you don't need. Now, another factor with the kilns is the venting system. So so on your vents, understand how the venting system works and why do we need to know this? You need to understand because if you have issues where you wanna ensure that your firing is happening a lot smooth, you can anticipate how long that firing should go. And based upon your vent system, that is gonna change what's going on. Uh, most kilns that I've been around have an overhead venting system where you have like one of those big silver dome things that you pull over the top of the kiln. This is to be vented directly outside and that's just a top vented kiln. It's basically just using gravity and the vent holes and any escaping element areas inside the kiln to pull, is, is to just let the gases free float out of the kiln out of the into the atmosphere. Those kinds of vents are fine. They work just fine. There's no issues with that. If the, the issue that I have with it is if your vent and your kiln are inside the classroom, my rule of thumb is don't fire during the school day if you can help it. Um, I'll get into that in just a second after I go to the other vent. The other vent that you have is a down vent where it's a box that kind of comes out of the bottom of the kiln and what that does it's got a it's got a fan in it that is sucking all the exhaust fumes that are coming out of the kiln out of the bottom and taking it directly outside this is kind of a, a two-way street i prefer that because it, it forces the circulation of the heat to go around the wear a lot more evenly uh, the downside is is that if that fan motor busts or anything that venting system that you got is kind of kaput and you need to fix it uh also you have elements from outside that could be going back into the kiln and i'm kind of like leery on i want to be able to block all of that so that debris animals anything like that don't come into the vent system and then we got other problems to deal with and i just don't like that now getting back to the your kiln is inside the classroom and it is just there and i wouldn't fire it with anybody in the room because when you're firing ceramics in the kiln you have a couple things that are going on if you're doing a bisque firing the first firing where you're taking the chemical the clay from the raw state into the bisque form the first firing with the biscuit firing uh that's where everything turns like pinky that's where you're going from the raw the bone dry version to the bisque wear version that you can glaze that sound means that it's been fired once and it's gotten all the chemical water fired out of it. And this I really put in here mainly for my students who always ask me like, what's the difference? What When you say chemical, what does that mean? That means that the bone dry wear, all the physical wire has evaporated out of that. What we're doing is taking it from the, the bone dry side to the bisque firing, that's taking all the chemical water out of it. We're actually at a molecular level. We're taking, we're taking the H2O bonds that are tied to that silica the alumina the, the, that are that are inside the clay and we're going to permanently le uh, pull those out of the clay itself changing the physical structure of the clay uh, i usually use stoneware clay uh, if you want to get into that i have another video that talks about all clay types and you guys can check that out train of thought gone left the station <sighs> Now, during these, this firing process, you have two types of heat that are that are happening. You have 
um, residual heat and then you have radiating heat. Now the residual heat is the heat of the kiln that's firing, that's happening during the firing process and that's gonna be held inside the kiln by the fire brick. This is a fire brick. Notice all the holes, looks like Swiss cheese. Now there's a big difference between refractory brick and kiln brick, which is again what this is. So kiln brick is basically it's a, a lump of clay, smash it full of sawdust and then burned and then baked it into the kiln. All the sawdust then bakes out of it. So it has all these little porous little holes that hold on to heat really, really well. The refractory brick is a much stronger brick and it does hold heat, but it's really for exterior builds or what I've used it for is to prop kiln shelves up with. Make sure that you are, know the difference between the two because this kiln brick is very, very, very brittle. Um, it's almost like a balsa wood in the way that you could carve it and create it in different shapes. But this is the one that you ought to take care of because as it, it's the interior of the kiln and your coils that are inside the kiln kind of sit directly in it. You want to make sure that you don't bump it and just treat it with kid gloves. Make sure that you don't bump it, crack it, do anything that harm it. But you can use um, different bits of kiln wire to repair it, which isn't really hard. You just kind of shove it in and just kind of work the two pieces of metal together to, to bind those pieces back in place. Just be very cautious with this. And that brings us back to the radiation versus residual heat. So the radiated heat is the heat that's gonna come off of the outside of the kiln. So the outside of the kiln is going to get hot. It will burn you if you touch it, but it's not as hot as the interior of the kiln. The outside of the kiln gets, you know, a couple hundred, like about 150, 200 degrees hot. It is hot and it is dangerous. Um, my rule of thumb is just make sure that you keep about a foot to a foot and a half of space between it and anything else, be it paper or anything that might be combustible. I keep paper in my kiln room because that's my storage room and that's where I got space. Um, but I do keep in mind that I keep that amount of distance to ensure that there's cleanliness in the kiln room and that everything stays relatively fine. Now that brings us to loading a kiln. Now, most of us have enough kiln shelves where we can put an extra kiln shelf at the bottom or you might have a large disc or octagon kiln shelf that you can put down at the bottom. That's gonna ensure that when you fire that you're not firing directly on the bottom of the kiln itself. You never wanna fire directly on the, on the brick itself. The reason being is because if there's glaze, if there's an explosion from a piece of bisque that had trapped air in it and it pops you don't want anything to come into play where it's going to harm the kiln shelves I mean, harm the the bottom of the kiln but a kiln shelf is that really strong dense piece of um it's ceramic wear but it's really really st sturdy durable and it can take a hit so i put everything on there and never put anything near the kiln wall and that also includes the wall don't make make sure your pieces are you know not butting up against it at all, that there is space between it. Again, taking care of the, the interior fire brick as much as possible. Now on to posts and shelves, as you guys are building up, make sure that those two shelves are butted up against each other. What you're doing is when you put down your kiln shelves, make sure you have three to four feet per shelf so everything is properly balanced out. Everything is equal weight distributed across the entire shelf. You don't want anything to be uh, off weight because then it'll sag slump. Uh, that's why over time you will start to see warpage in your kiln shelves depending on which kind you buy. And finally, post for this section. So I've got a series of different post options that we have. Um, I've got these ones I'll show you in just a second. Most, hello, stay still. Most commonly you guys are gonna have these honking kiln stilts that you guys are gonna normally have. And they come in, didn't hurt. They're gonna come in various sizes and they're all kind of built the same way. Four pin, four part, four parts and, uh, and just, you know. Now, with kiln, sh with kiln stilts, I never recommend stacking them unless you really have to. It is possible you can do it, but again, don't recommend it, especially with these, uh, these really thin ones. Uh, just stacking them one on top of another, it will stay, but uh, again, just for safety's sake and making sure that your wares don't fall and collapse, that's not what I would recommend. I do, however, have these interlocking ones. You can see plug on that side, got a hole in this side, and those pieces just kind of lock in place and you can stack them on top of each other and they hold pretty well. Uh, if you had like one of the larger posts, we put it on top just like this to elevate the shelf up, uh, just up a little bit. Again, make sure that you have enough for all the posts that you're doing on that level so that everything's balanced. 
and that's just gonna make life a lot easier. Now, when I'm loading up my kiln, I always put a smaller, thinner layer on the bottom. So tiles, small, short little cups that only take a very small little shelf space and then put a shelf on there so that I'm not putting a tall piece and then stacking smaller pieces up. I'm putting a small piece first and then doing taller pieces. Reason I'm doing this is because of that just a little bit of rise before I put another shelf on there is giving much more stability than doing a larger expanse in between from the bottom up that finally on to my last part my last part is firing and dealing with firing in general now there are cone cone charts that you can get and hang them up in your kiln room your temps are done in cones now what is the temperature what is a cone cone is the let me grab the box a trip down memory lane for all of us we have the Orton cone boxes now Orton makes uh, the all the parametric cones of yesteryear that we would use in firing. So here we have these are O1s. On this one we have O4. What you need to remember about parametric cones are old school. If your kiln is an old school manual kiln, inside of it you have the parameter that kind of comes out and it has that little stilt thing. You put your cone into it, it holds it right there, and then as the so put my cone in there as the kiln is heating and and it's slowly coming up to temp the cone pin will come down snap that cone in half and you'll have a nice bent cone in between that tells the temperature of when the kiln has reached the right temperature it's, it melts and cuts off the kiln the parametric cones melt at a certain temperature so each one of these is regulated to melt at a specific temperature cone 04 is 1945 cone 05 is 19 is 1888 and cone 06 is 1828 so it goes from 0 22 Two up to one and then one up to ten that's the scale that you would see for most cone firings uh, most of your bisque firings are going to be between that 04 06 to 04 range and then your hot your finishing firings if you have low fire clay it's still gonna be the same range the 04 to 06 if you're firing anything that is going to be food based I don't really recommend using low fire clay for that, but it's cheaper. It's cheaper to buy th that clay. But, but if you are fire, if you are eat, doing anything that is food safe, bisque fire to 04, glaze fire to 06. This makes it food safe. You always want a bisque fire two cones higher than your glaze firing. Uh, it's because it makes the clay more porous from the bisque so that when the glaze fire happens it shrinks and connects to the glaze at a better rate this was given to me during a, a mako ceramic class that i took years ago a little bit of knowledge to, to impart across the the boards for you guys make sure that again food safe two cones higher bisque to the glaze fire if you're doing stoneware or porcelain you're going to fire up in the higher end which could be anywhere between cone six all the way up to cone ten if you're dealing with stoneware, earthen, um, if you're dealing with an earthenware, earthenware is going to be in the lower range. So usually cone O three, cone three, uh, is where most of that tops out at. And again, it all depends on the kind of clay that you have. Know that temperature or know that cone because if you go over that, there's a reason why it says that's the max cone. The elements, the chemicals that are inside of that clay melt at a different temperature, and they will start to melt and they will turn into liquid on your kiln shelf. I thought clay would never do that. Clay can do that. You can melt it completely off, so it's completely gone. Now, back to the parameter. The parameter is what tells us the temperature inside of our kiln. Most of us, if we're lucky, we have a, a digital kiln. That is my favorite now. I grew up and I was raised on the old school manual kiln with the three dials, and you had to guess at what temperature it was. The parameter is attached to the kiln sitter. The kiln sitter is where you set the dial to tell, you, to tell the kiln of how long it's going to fire, and it's gauging what the temperature is inside the kiln. If you're doing an old school manual kiln, your parameter is solely based upon the cones and how the cone was placed into your kiln. Now, depending on how you want to fire, you're going to put your cone, your kiln cone in there at a different angle. So what I like to do, so here are my three pins that are going to hold my cone in place, just like so. If I want to fire higher, I'm going to go to the thicker end of the cone so it has more mass to go through. If I want to fire it a little less, put it down on the thinner end of the cone. And what that does is as the cone is melting in the kiln, it's going to break at a different point or bend at a different point in the melt point, And that's going to shut the kiln off. If you're dealing with old school cones, do a couple tests. Never put in a load that you think is going to work a certain way because 99% uh, of the time it doesn't. And take the best notes that you possibly can. When did you change the temperatures? What what was the temperature outside? When was this during the year? Uh, was the humidity level at a certain thing? There's all these little components that I go into account when I'm doing a firing in general. 
But if I'm doing a specialty fire and I'm doing something to test something out, I need to know all these variables. It does tend to fluctuate what's going to happen in the kiln and what the end product is going to be. A bisque fire versus a glaze fire. The big two things that you need to know are this. If it's a bisque fire, all the clay can stack, stack together and touch together and there's no issues whatsoever. If it is a glaze fire, you cannot let that stuff touch because the glaze basically turns into glue. And what happens with glue? Things stick. And when those pieces stick together, then, well, it's a really cool assemblage piece that you just made uh, if all those pieces are sticking together. So make sure that doesn't happen. Once you've fired the piece, the bottoms of the piece out of the bisque fire, make sure there's no glaze on the bottom. So as it sits on the shelf, it doesn't become glued to the shelf. Best thing to help you out and make sure that that works, kiln wash. Kiln wash here is made of a couple different chemicals. One of them is alumina. The alumina Alumina is a, it's a chemical that doesn't burn until like cone 13. So it, it takes, it. I think it's like 3000 degrees is the melt point of alumina. Uh, your kiln is never gonna reach that. So the reason we, that's why we use that as a mass element inside of kiln washes because it doesn't melt. If glaze gets stuck to it, it chips off relatively easy. Kind of flakes off, it kind of sticks to it and then like just peels off like an old sticker, which is really handy because then your kiln shelf is not damaged. Make sure that you put on a super thick coat. If you're using kiln wash for the first time, you can pre-bake them or just run it as a bit in a bisque fire everything will come out just, but when you paint them give them you know like an hour a couple hours to dry so that's fully dried before you put that in the kiln because you're having moisture content that's going to go in the air and that becomes a little bit of a problem if you're doing a speed ramp kiln firing last thing there is the post firing piece um make sure that your kiln is cool let it cool down completely uh typically me i fire over a week why because i've got a digital kiln and i don't have to babysit anymore that's like the best thing ever uh why i love having a digital kiln having my old school manual kiln i would start the fire in the early morning because i had my kiln in a separate room if your kiln is in the room again i said this before in the video do not fire it while the kids are in there while you are in there the things that are coming out of the kiln are very very harmful it is not air that you want to breathe it, you are it's basically like you chewed up a cigarette uh and swallowed it whole it's just not going to do well for your body especially when it gets into your lungs it's the same thing as if you were firing a bisque firing especially silica does leach into the air and it does get into the atmosphere uh, i don't want to scare you guys but i definitely want you to be knowledgeable so that you are aware of how to fire safely and that silica if you look at windows especially in, a, in an older school building where there's a kiln room if there's windows that are on the door of the kiln room they should have little scratches in them because the sil silica etches into the glass over like 10 to 20 years so fyi just take that into account but again back to the the post firing what i like to do is do it over the weekend because my fire is usually in on saturday night sunday morning that gives it a at least another 24 hours to cool down before Monday morning when I roll in. I was doing it during the school day and I was firing and then I cooled off the night before. I do not open it for a full 24 hours. This is to ensure that the kiln has cooled down completely and I don't have any issues uh, when I open up the kiln at all. And that's just a safety measure more than anything. There is thermal shock, which happens when you're taking the cool air from outside of the kiln and it's rushing into the kiln when you open the lid. That does become a problem, but it really only uh, is a major problem if you are, if it's like six, 700 degrees and you open up the kiln and it whoosh a cool, cool air, pieces can pop the glaze shifts really Really quickly uh, because you're you're solidifying glass elements and those things crack and break because it's fragile it's a fragility thing wow there's a lot of information i just kind of rammed off fast as possible awesome guys hope that you guys have something fun out of today's class close out the class like we always do don't forget to like subscribe share all the various platforms get the message out to as many teachers friends students as i possibly can educate the masses as the thing that i love to do so loud i'm sorry uh but don't forget if you guys have a question comment or concern during today's class raise your hands in the comments below happy to answer the questions from my classmates on that i'll see you guys next class until then later guys